From the halls of the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C., to your living room, this is Capitol Talk with Congressman Tim Bishop. Capital Talk, an exclusive interview with your Congressman Tim Bishop. Congressman Bishop represents New York's first congressional district, which spans the eastern half of Long Island from Smithtown to Montauk Point. A lifelong resident of Long Island, he's proud of his record of hard work and effective constituent service. He works seven days a week and has hosted well over 100 town hall meetings throughout Suffolk County. He served in Congress since 2002 with a primary focus on protecting Long Island's middle class families. His priorities in Congress are improving the economy and encouraging job growth, fighting for veterans, safeguarding the environment, and strengthening access to education. Congressman Bishop is a senior member of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure and ranking member of the Subcommittee on Water Resources and the Environment. He also serves on the Committee on Education and the Workforce, where his focus is expanding access to higher education. Today we'll discuss recent developments in, in the 112th Congress and issues that directly affect Long Island. We'll also feature some questions submitted to Congressman Bishop by his constituents. I'm Eddie Shimkus, Senior Legislative Assistant to Congressman Bishop, and Congressman, welcome to welcome. Thank you, Eddie. Sure. Uh, so let's let's jump right to it. Uh, your top priority in Congress um, has 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 been strengthening the economic recovery and encouraging the creation of middle class jobs. What are some of the actions that you've taken in Congress, and how are and how are you fighting for these jobs on Long Island? Well, I'd say there's two things principally that. Um, that I've been pushing for one uh, for a long period of time, frankly. <clears throat> and this, let me start with that. And that is that we need to make a significant investment in improving our infrastructure, highways, roads, bridges, um, wastewater infrastructure, all of that. Uh, we, it is all, uh, on, both on Long Island and all across the country, uh, badly in need of upgrade and repair, and in some cases expansion. And we know that for every billion dollars of infrastructure investment, we create at least 30 to 35,000 new jobs. Now, <clears throat> unemployment in the heavy construction industry on Long Island is around 35%. That's that's intolerable. That That's simply, uh, that's simply Simply something that that government must act to deal with, and one of the great frustrations that I and others uh, who think like me about the importance of infrastructure uh, have had over the recent um, months is the really the refusal of the Congress, the leadership of the Congress to push uh, a reauthorization of the surface transportation bill that would significantly increase the federal government's investment in infrastructure. So that's something we absolutely have to do. Uh, I've introduced a bill that would create different financing mechanisms uh, for wastewater infrastructure. We have communities all over Long Island, in our district, most specifically Rocky Point uh, and the Mastic Shirley Peninsula, where economic development is thwarted because we do not have have the ability to deal with with the sewage. <clears throat> so that's that's an example of something that we should be doing that would both create jobs, protect the environment, and allow for economic expansion of communities, which would create even more jobs. The second thing that we've been working on very, very um, uh, uh, hard over the last several weeks has been the president's proposal with respect to uh, to job creation and specifically the um, reauthorization or the continuation of the payroll tax reduction that first went into place in 2011 that expires December 31st 2011 uh, the president has proposed not just expand extending it uh, but also expanding it right now <clears throat> Social Security withholding is at 4.2 percent uh, of, a, of a person's uh, paycheck um, it used to be uh, under for years it was 6.2 percent knocked it down to 4.2 now the president's proposing we knock it down yet again to 3.1 percent this would put an extra fifteen hundred dollars in the pockets of uh, of the standard uh, wage earner in our district. And that $1,500 is $1,500 that they're going to spend maybe buying their kids something or 
t going to the movies or, or going out to dinner or whatever it is. But whatever it is, it's going to be money that would stimulate the economy. So these are two things that we absolutely must get past. And I'm very hopeful that between now and when we break for Christmas that we'll be able to get this done. Great. Uh, <clears throat> now, you recently launched a, a business retention task force with uh, Brookhaven Supervisor Mark Alesco uh, to keep local jobs in Suffolk County. Uh, how are you approaching this well, important um, effort? Th this is a, a, a great effort that I'm, I'm very proud to partner with Supervisor Lesko uh, on, and, and he is truly a, a visionary in terms of the work that he's doing in, in Brookhaven Town. Basically, what we're doing is we put together a collection of people, a task force of people, and we are reaching out to every single business in Brookhaven in town. We're finding out uh, how things are going for them. We're finding out if there is any potential for them uh, to consider leaving the town, and if so, what types of incentives could we put in place to keep them in the town? Uh, and, and so, uh, at a minimum, we don't want any more surprises. We don't want any more, any more companies leaving, leaving Brookhaven Town for upstate New York or, mm -hmm. or North Carolina or Georgia, and we want to have a chance to, in effect, put an offer on the table to keep businesses here and keep the jobs here. And we're in the early stages of that effort, but people are responding pretty enthusiastically to it. We've had several very substantive meetings with employers, some of whom are struggling to stay in the town, and we're trying to work out uh, various provisions so that they can stay. Great. Uh, now, with <clears throat> keeping jobs on Long Island in mind, uh, let's talk about your efforts to fight outsourcing of American jobs to other con uh, countries. Uh, and in fact, we have a constituent question. Uh, pa Patricia from Wisconsin asks, uh, what are you doing to keep jobs in the U.S., and can Congress provide any incentives for companies to keep jobs here? Uh, there's a couple things that Congress needs to do. One is that there are some provisions of the tax code that frankly incentivize companies to move jobs offshore and we've got to fix those. We've got to take those incentives out of the tax code and, in fact, build in incentives in the tax code to keep jobs right here. Uh, and, and, I, and I think there, there were efforts to do that uh, over the last several years. We passed some bills in the House of Representatives uh, a year ago, two years ago, uh, that would have done just that. Uh, those bills, though, were not taken up by the Senate, so it's, it, we, the, the current law continues to to prevail. Um, I've also uh, filed a bill along with several of my colleagues uh, that would um, attempt to discourage outsourcing by uh, making companies that have outsourced jobs at any time over the last five years ineligible to compete for federal contracts. I think that's something that's, that's very important to do. I'm about to uh, introduce a bill having to do with call centers that, again, would encourage uh, the creation of call centers here in this country as opposed to offshore. So these are all things that we need to do. But, but I mean, it's estimated that we're losing somewhere between 11 and 15,000 jobs uh, a month as a country uh, as a result of outsourcing. And so really, it's one of the reasons why our, our, our um, economic recovery has, uh, is, has been so difficult uh, to maintain, and it's why our, our jobs deficit is as, is as strong as it, or is, a, is as extensive as it is. Mm -hmm. um, now, you touched on it a little bit with our first question, uh, but um, you know, in general, do you, do you support tax relief for the middle class? And, and if you could, uh, just expand upon how cutting taxes for the middle class will help the economy for well, I, I've 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 always supported tax relief for the middle class. Uh, I've never once voted for a tax increase for the middle class, uh, and and I believe that putting money in the hands of people who are likely to spend it on the everyday necessities of life is a way that we're going to help stimulate our economy. So it's it's why I have supported uh, the continuation of the so-called Bush tax cuts for families that make less than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. It's why I have supported the expansion of the 10 percent tax bracket. It's why I've supported the continuation of the child tax credit. It's why I supported um, the reduction of the pay payroll withholding from 6.2 percent mm -hmm. to 4.2 percent last year. It's why I'm now supporting uh, the for the, the continuation of that and increasing it to a 3.1 percent uh, reduction. So um, I, I just think that it's important. I think it's important that we have a tax structure that that is both progressive and fair. Uh, and and um, I think in some cases we don't have that. Uh, but um, I absolutely believe uh, that middle class families, particularly now, need relief. 
and one of the ways we can provide that relief is in the in the most immediate case by by it at a minimum continuing uh, the social security payroll tax reduction uh now, the economic downturn has been tough on people on a fixed income, uh, but good news was recently announced regarding Social Security and Medicare benefits for 2012, correct? Yes. Um, the, social, the Social Security trustees announced that there will be a 3.6 percent cost of living adjustment effective January 1st, 2012 for all Social Security recipients. Uh, as a little known and often misunderstood fact about the Social Security COLA that it is it is not authorized by the Congress. The mm -hmm. Congress has no role. Uh, it is something that is determined by the Social Security trustees. There was no COLA in 2010 or 2011. There will be one in 2012. Welcome news. For the average senior, it'll mean an, a, an extra $45 or so per month uh, that, that they'll have available to them. The other really good piece of news is that um, um, the Medicare premiums are only going to go up about three dollars and in past years when there has been a social security cola a lot of it has been eaten up by an increase in mm -hmm. the medicare premium this year that's not going to happen i think the medicare premium increase is three dollars and fifty cents so the average senior should have a net of Social Security and, and Medicare of about $40 more a month. And the fact that the Social Security premium is going up as, pardon me, the, the, the Medicare premium is going up uh, as modestly as it is, is a result of provisions contained in the Affordable Care Act <clears throat> that we passed in, in 2009. There are lots of provisions in there that are going to be playing themselves out over the next uh, several years that are of benefit in many cases to seniors. Can you expand just a, a, well, a bit I mean, on the, uh, the benefit? For seniors? Well, I mean, just just two very quickly. One is uh, for seniors who have a Medicare Part D prescription drug plan. Um, the, in the year we're now in, 2011, the average senior has saved almost $600 in terms of their exposure to the donut hole mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, when, they, when they still have prescription drug expense but no, no coverage from their insurance policy. And that's because of a provision in the Affordable Care Act that required uh, pharmaceutical companies to provide drugs to families when they're in the donut hole at a 50% discount. Um, seniors now also can avail themselves of an annual physical uh, paid for fully by Medicare. They can also avail themselves of an annual so-called wellness visit uh, from physicians, again, paid for fully by Medicare, no cost share at all. And seniors are now taking advantage of these provisions in huge numbers, and they're realizing significant savings. Great. That's great news. <clears throat> uh, now, speaking of Social Security and Medicare, um, both of those programs have been in the news recently in the context of the discussions about um, our nation's budget, uh, which brings us to another constituent question. Uh, Patrick from Ridge asks, how do you propose to strengthen the retirement system for future generations? Well, I think, I th first off, I think it's, it's a very important issue, particularly as the baby boomers age and enter retirement, and as, particularly as we recognize that one out of every three dollars we spend in this country are in two programs, Social Security and Medicare. So mm -hmm. a huge piece of our national uh, budget is comprised in just those two programs. Um, <clears throat> both require work to be strengthened. Social Security is vastly easier to strengthen than is Medicare. The Medicare uh, trust fund uh, was ex the life of the Medicare trust fund was extended by about 12 years as a result of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, but still requires work. Social Security trust fund is expected to be solvent through 2039. Uh, so we we have some very hard decisions that we have to make over the next several years with respect to both Social Security and Medicare. But my own view is that it is absolutely imperative that those two programs form the foundation of a stable retirement, uh, and that is the the least that we owe uh, the, 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 you know, a, a generation of workers that have moved this country forward. So um, uh, I think, I, I hope to be able to join uh, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, over the next several years to put in place um, the policies that we'll need to strengthen those two programs. And I think we all have to fully recognize that we're going to have to make some very tough decisions. But they're decisions that in the long run, as I say, will provide the kind of stable uh, retirement that, that our seniors deserve. 
switching gears a bit, uh, a key part of making sure uh, the United States stays competitive is access to a college education, but the cost is often a barrier. Uh, we've had many constituents write in uh, expressing concern about cuts to, to federal education programs. Uh, particularly Dominic, uh, a college student uh, from Lake Grove, wrote to you asking, how are you working to make college more affordable for the middle class and for students, and what is Congress's role in making sure there are jobs for college graduates? Let me take the first part first. Sure. Uh, Congress. Um, has over the last several years um, worked very hard to solidify uh, the so-called Title IV uh, student financial aid programs. There are five of them. Uh, and I have been very proud to be uh, pretty much at ground zero of that effort given my background in higher education and given my expertise in student financial aid programs. I think I'm the only member of Congress that has ever administered uh, student financial aid programs. Um, but we have so significantly strengthened the Pell Grant, which is the foundation of a student's financial aid package. And um, have in, has, we've increased increase the maximum Pell Grant to $5,550, which is a very, very important thing. Uh, we have made the student loan program both more accessible and less um, expensive to administer uh, by converting to fully what's called the direct lending program mm -hmm. as opposed uh, to um, <clears throat> to uh, the Stafford loan program. And that, that again, simplifies the process by which students apply and makes it less expensive for the, for the nation to administer that program, which then makes other resources available to students. So that's there's one piece of student of, of student affordability is the amount of money that the federal government, the state government, and the institutions themselves provide to needy students so that they can afford to attend the college of their choice. That's one. The second piece, more difficult is working with the colleges and the universities to try to hold down costs, which in turn will hold down price. And the single greatest driver of, of price increases uh, in the recent past has been basically the, the uh, great difficulty that state governments have had in providing adequate financing to public institutions in their states. And an, the enormous majority of students attend state supported schools, publicly supported schools as opposed to, to private schools or for-profit schools. And so that's a huge piece of affordability. States being able to make the appropriate contributions to maintain their public college systems. But there's also a lot of other things we can be looking at. Best practices among colleges for how they hold down costs, perhaps consortiums of colleges uh, to, to, to do the things that students don't really notice, like purchasing and, uh, you know, accounts receivables mm -hmm. and collections and all of those things that are really back office functions that perhaps can be combined from colleges in a particular region to realize some savings, and those savings would be passed on to students in the form of either lower tuition or at least smaller tuition increases, all very important. With respect to the second part of the question, um, it really goes back to where we began uh, this conversation, mm -hmm. which is that, um, I mean, there's the government has two means by which it can try to stimulate economic growth. One is monetary policy, and we've pretty much gone as far as we can go there. I mean, you can only, interest rates can't get much lower sure. than, than where they are. Uh, <clears throat> and then the other is fiscal policy, and that's the kind of uh, of stimulus that, that we're trying to create, for example, uh, by reducing the um, the Social Security payroll tax reduction, by, by continuing to provide unemployment benefits. Economists tell us that um, the single most effective thing we can do to put money in, uh, to stimulate the economy is, is to extend unemployment compensation because that clearly provides money to students, well, not students, money to people who, um, who are going to spend it immediately on the everyday necessities of life. And the biggest problem with job creation, my, my, you know, my ultimate point, the biggest job with, problem with job creation is people aren't hiring because they don't have customers. So we need mm -hmm. to increase aggregate demand. The rate of increase aggregate demand is to provide more money to people so that they can, they can go out and spend it, which will then reverberate through the economy. So we have to provide our businesses with customers, and if we do, those businesses will expand and hire. Okay. Um, <clears throat> 
let's move on to uh, another one of your uh, priorities uh, in Congress, the environment. Uh, Lewis from Smithtown wrote in about preserving uh, the Long Island Sound, uh, and he asks, what have you been working on this Congress to protect the sound? Well, I've done two things. Uh, one is we have uh, refiled uh, the reauthorization of the National Estuaries Program. The Long Island Sound is one of 28 estuaries of uh, of national significance, and th this program provides funding to maintain water quality uh, in the sound and in uh, and in the the watershed area of the sound. And the second is a bill that focuses exclusively on Long Island Sound and is designed to provide even further protections uh, to uh, the sound, to provide for uh, additional work with respect to water quality, to expand the definition of the watershed area of the sound, so mm -hmm. that we focus on non source point, uh, non-point sources of pollution uh, that, that ultimately um, ultimately find their way into the sound. Uh, so this would be a, a very important piece of legislation uh, that I very much hope we can get past. I, 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 uh, both, both are important, uh, and I think the National Estuaries Program one will pass. Uh, it's the Long Island Sound one. I, my my co-sponsor is Peter King, um, fellow Long Islander, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so we both very much recognize uh, both the environmental importance of the sound, but also the economic importance of the sound. I mean, there's an enormous amount of economic activity that is rooted in, in, in the sound, whether it be commercial fishing or recreational fishing or recreational boating or travel and tourism. It's a huge part of the stability of our local economy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> very important. Uh, next issue, deficit reduction, which has been you know, uh, a persistent issue, this Congress. Uh, what is your approach to reducing the nation's deficit? Well, I think we have to take a balanced approach, and that certainly is what I've been advocating. And and um, and what that means is that we all have to sacrifice, and we all have to do our share. Um, um, and I also think that, that deficit reduction can't just focus on cutting expenditures. It's got to focus on cutting expenditures and also at the same time increasing revenue. We've had several bipartisan efforts um, that have looked at our long-term finances, and they basically have all come to the same conclusion, whether it's uh, Dominici Rivlin or Simpson Bowles or the Gang of Six Whatever it is, they all say we have to do three things: that we have to rein in the growth of entitlement spending, we have to we have to rein in domestic spending, and we have to increase revenue. I mean, there's there's only so many moving parts in our in our budget. Those are the three principal moving parts, and those are the three things that we absolutely have to see to it uh, that we do. Uh, and and. Um, Finding consensus around those issues has been what's difficult. It, the breakdown of the super committee, mm -hmm. for example, broke. Uh, it, it came about as a result of the Republicans on the super committee being unwilling to contemplate revenue increases. Mm -hmm. And 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 very candidly, uh, none of us want to raise taxes. None of us want to. None of us want to place more burden uh, on on on. Uh, <clears throat> You know uh, the people we represent, but the but the, the 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 cold hard truth is that we simply cannot balance our budget without more revenue. So somewhere along the line, whether it's revisions to the tax code, whether it's changes to the corporate tax structure, whether it's shutting down loopholes, whether it's closing down the ability to shelter income offshore, whatever it is, we mm -hmm. need to be looking at those things and aggressively pursuing them, or else the programs that that are that are so important to so many people, like Social Security, like Medicare, like maintaining our national defense, we're simply not going to be able to maintain them at the levels we're at now unless we have the ability to, to support them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a, f a few minutes left um, <clears throat> with just a couple of questions left to go. Uh, I know uh, before the end of the year there are a couple of must-do items. One, we'll go back to Medicare, includes the Medicare Physician Payment Schedule, yes. also called the SGR, the Doc Fix. Uh, has to be done. Ha has to be done. Uh, if we don't act by December 31st, I think uh, a 28% reduction 
in uh, reimbursements for physicians who provide services to Medicare uh, patients will kick in. That's simply unacceptable. Mm -hmm. It's simply intolerable. We cannot ask physicians to take that that much of a pay cut. And what will happen is physicians will simply walk away from the program, mm -hmm. and that will then disenfranchise the seniors who so badly need the care that the doctors are now providing them with and doing so at a, at a very high level. So we simply must fix that. That's one of the must-pass items that we have between now and December 31st. We also have uh, the Social Security uh, you know, payroll tax mm -hmm. reduction. We have unemployment compensation. We have FAA reauthorization. Mm -hmm. We have, I think, the surface transportation bill. We've got an awful lot of things that we've got to pass between now and December 31st. We have, we have all the appropriations bills, either that or continuing resolution. Mm -hmm. So we got our work cut out for us between now uh, and December 31st. And where do you see the the 112th Congress going in the new year? Um, you know, well, what, I, what's the, your outlook? One of the things I hope is I hope that we will approach the new year and the issues that we must tackle in a fashion that is more collegial and more bipartisan than at least what we had at the early part of the 112th Congress. I mean, from January through at least the end of July, early August, uh, we lurched from confrontation to confrontation, from crisis to crisis, from threat of shutdown to threat of shutdown. No one benefits from that. Mm -hmm. No one benefits. Certainly not the people we were elected to represent. Uh, there have been some small signs at, at greater cooperation, at greater collegiality, at a greater willingness to approach problem solving in a bipartisan fashion, and frankly, a greater willingness to compromise. When you have a a significant subset of of our colleagues who who think that compromise is a four-letter word that makes the kind of decisions that we need to make all the more difficult to put in place so I'm hopeful that there's a there's a, in effect a learning process going on mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that all of us recognize that that we do our constituents no favor at all when we in effect threaten them with the potential for shutdowns with the potential for the loss of services we've got to find a way to work together we've got to find a way to put in place solutions to the problems that we all recognize we have mm -hmm. and we're all going to have to be willing to give a little in order to get a little. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and now, Congressman, uh, let, we can start wrapping up. If, if people have any uh, questions or, or need federal assistance with, or need assistance with, with uh, federal programs or, or benefits, what can they do? Well, I, I would say um, they should contact first our office in Patchogue, and, and the phone number for that is area code 631-289-6500. And we've got a team of people in our office in Patchogue, which is on Oak Street in downtown Patchogue, that are, frankly, experts at, at solving problems and helping people navigate, uh, if you will, the bureaucracy of the federal government. We have two people in our office uh, that all they do all day, every day, are veterans issues, and they're exceptionally skilled at it. Uh, we have uh, one person in our office, all she does all day, every day, is deal with immigration-related issues, and she's extremely good at it. We have a young man in our office uh, who deals with um, senior issues, Medicare, uh, Social Security, also deals with Medicaid, deals with housing. Uh, he is absolutely first rate. We've helped thousands and thousands of people get their problems resolved and whether it's getting uh, a long overdue medal for a veteran or increasing his or her disability rating so they get the compensation they deserve or whether it's helping uh, someone struggling to pay their mortgage and getting them a mortgage modification and working as their advocate with the bank or whether it's helping a family uh, whose, uh, you know, whose son mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is in another country and can't get home. A lot of the things that we work on, we do this all day, every day. Um, <clears throat> we're really, really good at it. And um, um, I would invite anyone that, that needs our help to, to give us a shot. Now, sometimes we don't get to the right answer. Some problems don't have solutions. Uh, but but uh, if we don't get to the right answer, it won't be for lack of trying. So uh, I would certainly encourage people to be in touch with us. Great. Fantastic. Congressman Bishop, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you all for joining us. Again, that number is 289-6500. That's the Congressman's District Office in Patchogue. Uh, Thanks for joining us.